there it goes. <laughs> Scared us there for a second. Oh! I thought wind power on a car would be easy, but it's not. I started back in 2020 strapping a cheap turbine to my Bronco. When that didn't work, I designed my own turbine out of carbon fiber, eventually getting two kilowatts. Two kilowatts! <laughs> two <point one. laughs> Woo! Which my kids and I used to bake a pie on March 14. I smell pie. I smell pie too. But controversy erupted when measurements I collected suggested I might be able to use that power for better fuel economy. People said I'd be violating thermodynamics, which as an engineer, I'm well acquainted with. Now, if I were to put the turbine on top of the car, I totally agree. I'd be performing work on air that is normally undisturbed. But that's not what I'm proposing. Every moving car already performs work pushing through air in its path. This requires thousands of watts from the engine at highway speeds, burning additional fuel. My idea is to place a turbine in this path, attempting to steal back some of the wasted power, converting a portion of it into useful energy. But even if it works, I've never figured out how to use that energy to help the car down the road until now. Most of us think of batteries as something we use, then plug in to charge back up. But a car battery is different. Its only purpose is to start the car engine. Once it's running, all the car's electricity comes from the alternator. As my daughter starts my old Camry, we see the alternator initially generates 50 amps. Then over the next two minutes, drops to 16 as the battery becomes fully charged. This is how much electricity the engine requires to run the fuel pump, injectors, and ignition. Switching on the headlights, we see they draw an additional 11 amps for a total of 27. The blower fan set to high draws around 12 amps for a total of 39. But the biggest consumer of all is the rear window defrost, pulling 18 amps for a total of 57 amps. But wait, the battery is still connected to the car's electrical system, so it could be powering the vehicle, right? Actually, no. People insisted I was wrong about this on the prior wind power videos, so to prove it, I'm going to try something I've never done before disconnect the battery while the engine is running with all the accessories on. Will the engine die? Will the car explode? And ta-da, nothing. No connection to the battery at all. These are powered by gas. End of story. I rest my case. So why do I care so much about the car's alternator? Because it's critical to the wind power experiment we're going to perform. Multiplying 57 amps from our alternator times its charging voltage of 14 volts equals 800 watts of power. And since factory alternators are around 50% efficient, the mechanical load on the engine should be around 1600 watts. Since it takes roughly 15,000 watts to propel a car at highway speeds, these electrical loads represent an additional 10% load on the engine, which reduces fuel economy which in my mind presents a perfect opportunity to test whether wind power on a moving vehicle is truth or fiction. My plan is to build two small turbines capable of generating the 800 watts required by our fully loaded electrical system. If critics are right and every watt generated by the turbines comes from additional gasoline, fuel efficiency will either stay the same or drop. If critics are wrong and aerodynamic losses can be salvaged, mileage will improve. Either way, I aim to settle this debate once and for all. If you have a prediction, make it known in the comments. And simply saying it won't work is for trolls. Instead, I want to hear a percentage improvement or reduction in fuel economy you think it will get. That way, when the project is done, we get to find out if anyone got it right. Our first challenge is finding a generator that meets the needs of both our turbine and electrical system. This Winzilla unit claims to be capable of 500 watts, but I know manufacturers love to advertise specs far above actual performance, so I'm not holding my breath. Sure enough, when driven by my lathe, I can't get more than 180 watts out of it, and even then it gets super hot. As a last ditch effort, I'm connecting an old solar charge controller, but neglected to check the voltage input limit. The seller isn't responding to emails, so I'm reluctantly purchasing a second bigger generator with more than double the specs. Now my lathe is the limiting factor, forcing me to go to my mill. I'm using an old heater element as the variable load, and I'm finally getting the 400 watts we need. 49.1 volts and 9.7 amps. Let's 
kill it. As a bonus, it's not getting super hot like the other one, suggesting the efficiency can't be all that bad. The next challenge is designing a mechanism to drive the generator that can be tuned based on wind speed. Commercial wind turbines do this by adjusting the angle or pitch of the blades. I thought I accomplished that with the carbon fiber blades on my Bronco, but the linear servo I chose was way underpowered, forcing us to pull over and adjust pitch manually. This time we're over-designing it with the stepper motor and lead screw that can't be back-driven by the blades. And instead of making everything out of steel, I'm saving weight and time leveraging a variety of materials and methods. The hub is a machined aluminum housing that I'm welding onto a fish-mouthed piece of smaller tubing. Then I'm pressing in the smallest taper roller bearings I could find. The drive shaft has to be hollow to accommodate the pitch mechanism and threaded to retain the roller bearings. Threading on a manual lathe can be nerve-wracking, but the more I do it, the better I get. It's also fun to see what you can make using old-school techniques on modest equipment. But no one has unlimited time, so whenever I can, I use 3D printed parts. And FDM printers are great, but the quality and strength can't compare to my Form 3. If you don't believe me, I did a video collecting real tensile data from a variety of printers. The Form 3 came out on top every time. In fact, Form Labs was so impressed, they loaned me their biggest resin printer for further testing. It's so big, I can easily print new turbine blades in one piece. And thanks to all that tensile testing, I know these blades are strong enough on their own without the need for carbon fiber wrapping. I know this because I performed finite element analysis, or FEA, loading them up with thrust and centripetal forces in CAD to ensure they remain within design limits. So as long as we don't exceed the rated RPM, we're good to go. The next step is electronics and programming. Thankfully, my son Grant is to the point where he can do it all on his own. If you can't tell, this is the pitch mechanism for the blades. Just turn a knob and an Arduino moves the stepper motor, showing the angle on the display. For a gut check, we're putting it all together in the shop using a box fan as our wind source. Of course, the belt is removed, so the turbine is free spinning, but it lets us verify the pitch mechanism can still function at 1000 RPM and that we don't have any major balance issues. It's also an opportunity for my kids to see up close how commercial turbines work. Thousand and three. Whoa! I'm surprised this thing has like exploded. It should go to 3,000, no problem. Oh. If I did my numbers right, and if the simulation is correct, I think there's a problem. Hope is not a strategy. Okay. Now that we've demonstrated a functional prototype, it's time to figure out the connection to the vehicle. We need something to securely mount and dismount two turbines without interfering with normal driving. It looks like we've achieved that until I try backing out of the driveway. Oops. So clearly the car needs to be on flat ground for turbine installation. But wait, we can't just connect 49 volts directly to our 12 volt automotive system, can we? No, we can't. A solar charge controller like the one from my last video could drop the voltage down, but honestly, I don't want some NPPT algorithm changing the load on our turbine. Instead, I'm using a heavy-duty buck converter we can manually set to output as much as 30 amps. After a bunch more soldering and wiring, we're finally ready for our first test drive. Now, before anyone freaks out that I'm driving this on the open road, Thanks to our adjustable pitch mechanism, we're able to orient the blades so the RPM is essentially zero when other cars are around. Sure, the simulations say everything should be safe, but I've seen too many surprises to trust a brand new prototype like this. <coughs> and though the pitch mechanism is working great, even when we do try to get power, it's just not working like it's supposed to. Wow. I think it's just not spinning fast at all. To find out why, we're heading back to the shop for some testing in the driveway. First, we verify the pitch mechanism is indeed working like it's supposed to. Then we hook up a battery charger and verify my theory that when we add power to the car, the alternator indeed reduces its output. That's a bit of a relief, honestly, because the whole project pivots on it. Lastly, we pin the generator down and drive it with a drill to ensure all our wiring is correct and that when the generator is driven, the output of the alternator is reduced. Check. 
Okay, so if that's working, that means our turbine wasn't supplying sufficient mechanical power to the generator. When I designed these blades, I used a free program called QBlade, the same software I used to design the giant blades for my Bronco. While they worked great and generated a lot of power, for this project, I opted to design for the least amount of drag, optimizing for efficiency. The blades are under a lot of force, and the FEA did show displacement at the tips. So either I botched the simulations, or these thin blades are flexing under load. Thankfully, these blades were 3D printed, so I can just redesign and print some more that look more like my originals. They're not as efficient according to the software, but the torque looks better and they're quite a bit thicker. Of course, that means they can't take as high of RPM before failure, but according to the FEA, they still should be fine within design limits. But now I'm concerned the hub itself may not hold up to the centripetal forces, so I'm machining my own out of billet aluminum. But with all that extra weight, we're getting vibration at higher RPMs and have to add weights to balance it out. Whoa, that's shaking. It looks like we finally got it figured out, so it's time to get on the road and test it. But this time at a more remote location. But every time we get up to about five amps, we start hearing a funny noise. What is that? In the interest of time, I 3D printed my timing pulleys and it's come back to bite me. Yeah, it slipped. Not this one. This one's holding. Oh. No, that one. <laughs> that one's slipping too. Ah! So we're heading back to the shop to machine metal hubs while simultaneously 3D printing timing pulley teeth that can be epoxied onto the hubs. These should be much harder to make slip under load. The next day, we're back at it again to see if we can get any more power to our electrical system. And to our relief, we're finally getting over 100 watts. Finally. What was the highest number you saw? Like 8.5. So 8.5 times 13.7. So we got over 100 watts. But we're back to getting that same funny noise. Out of frustration, I speed up even more to get some kind of response. And we do, just not the kind I was hoping for. Scared us there for a sec. Oh, we did lose it. Okay, so what happened? Well, in spite of our efforts with the metal hubs, the pulley still slipped. And when they slipped, all that two, three, 400 watts of power on the turbine spun up really high RPMs above design limits and it disintegrated. Now you might be wondering, Quint, why didn't you just put a key in the shaft so it couldn't slip? And that was my intent. But when I made the shaft, I accidentally put the wrong thread on there and it used up all the wall thickness that I meant to use for a key. So I need to machine a new shaft from scratch. Now, once I do that, we should readily get the 400 watts to the car. And once we do that, I'll be able to duplicate the whole setup on the other side so we have two turbines generating about 800 watts. We need those 800 watts so that there's no question what effect they're having on the mileage of the car. Duplicating the mechanics means duplicating the electronics, which means I'll need to get my son involved with another control setup for the pitch of the blades. And if you've been watching the channel for very long, you've seen him progress from me helping him set up a little control for a motor to him basically programming a CNC knife throwing machine all by himself. And it's making me feel like I need to catch up. But fortunately, both of us have access to Brilliant, an online learning platform that helps you learn interactively. For starters, I went to Thinking in Code under the Computer Science and Programming course. Though I already know the fundamentals, it was a good place to start to refresh my memory and build confidence in my skills. And sure, it's block programming instead of actual code, but that's what my son preferred to start with years ago, and now he's coding in a handful of languages. But if you need help with a specific language, Brilliant has you covered there too. The one I have the least experience with is Python, but fortunately there are lessons that start with the basics, drawing shapes with the turtle, all the way to higher level functions with arguments. To get started for free for 30 days, go to brilliant.org forward slash Quint Builds, and the first 200 of you will get a 20% discount off a premium membership. I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and thank you for considering Brilliant. So I get that this is a controversial project, 
But you know why it's controversial? Because nobody has done it yet in a way that is satisfying to all audiences. So that's what we're doing. Once it's done, anytime somebody brings it up, they can go, hey, go watch the video that that guy did. He answers that for you. And regardless of what people expect is the outcome, I hope we can all agree that this is at least a fair platform to test it on. Clearly there are a lot of smart people out there watching this, and something that I haven't seen explained well yet is the difference between a turbine mounted on the roof of the vehicle or mounted in front of it so the vehicle is in its wake. And if you have an answer for that, please, I would love to see your explanation in the comments. But regardless of the outcome, this project is a tremendous learning opportunity for mechanics, electronics, and programming. And that's what this channel is about. Because remember, BUILD stands for Better Understanding Involves Learning and Doing. If that kind of thing sounds cool to you, then please like, subscribe, and that way I'll see you in the next video.